can you hear us? Yes. yes. So, uh, yeah, I'm very happy to uh, uh, host the talk of uh, Tony. Uh, she has uh, seminal work in all areas of complexity. And today she's going to speak about uh, proof complexity and meta complexity at tutorial. Thank you. Hi, can you, can you hear me? Yes. Very. Okay, great. Um, really sorry I can't be there. It's snowing here. So I'm looking forward to the rain when I get there in a couple of weeks. Um, so, so this is intended to be a survey of proof complexity with focus on meta complexity issues. Um, and I haven't practiced the talk, so I have no idea if I'm going to have enough time for everything I have to say. But nonetheless, um, if you have any questions, just interrupt. I'm happy to, you know, happy to go at whatever pace uh, is, is good for everybody else. Um, yeah, uh, so if anyone has a question, please just say, I have a question and uh, hopefully Tony hears you when we have microphones. Yeah, if not, I hear you, you know, pretty clearly so you can. Okay, so I'm gonna start with just basic notions of proof systems, talk about the kind of standard ones. Um, I was gonna talk about a little bit about boundary arithmetic, but I have a feeling I won't have time for that. And then I'll talk about automatizability and feasible interpolation. Automatizability is sort of like the proof complexity analog of MCSP. And then I'll tell you what's known about lower bounds and um, conjectured hard to prove tautologies. And that a lot of them have a meta complexity flavor to them. And then we'll talk about actually meta mathematics of proving, thing, proving lower bounds like P not equal NP and what's known and what's conjectured. Um, okay, so I'll just start with a typical first slide. So the Propositional proof systems were defined by Cook and Reckow in the 70s, and they defined a proof system to be a poly time onto function that maps strings that are intended to represent proofs in some proof system to tautologies. So you can think of S as a, as a verification procedure that takes an encoding of a proof in some proof system and outputs whatever the tautology is that it's proving. And if it's illegal, if it's an illegal encoding, um, then you just return some canonical tautology. Um, so you, you should think of a proof system as just a sum, uh, some polytime algorithm that maps encodings of proofs in that proof system to tautologies. And we say the proof system, so it's a non-deterministic procedure basically. So when we say that S is polynomially bounded, if for every tautology F, there is some string S of polynomial size, polynomial length in the length of the tautology. Um, so in other words, there has to be some string A uh, that maps, what did I say here? That should be A, sorry, this is a mistake. So for every tautology F, there exists a string A where the length of A is polynomial in the length of F and A is a legal proof of that. Um, and Almost by definition, uh, Cook and Reco observed that the way that they defined a proof system, it's exactly, um, there exists a polynomially bounded proof system if and only if NP equals co-NP. Since a proof system is defined basically to be a non-deterministic procedure for a co-NP complete problem. Okay, um, so just some notes. Uh, so we can usually assume that uh, the class of all tautological propositional formulas, we can just assume that they're in DNF form by the usual way of representing Cook, you know, Cook's theorem way of representing an arbitrary formula by a DNF. Um, and secondly, sometimes we'll be viewing proof systems not as proving that something's a tautology, but is uh, refuting or proving that a particular formula is unsatisfiable. And it's pretty I'll show you later, but it's pretty easy given a proof system. For most proof systems, you can go back and forth. You can either view the proof system as proving tautologies or as refuting unsatisfiable formulas. Um, and just, just also to point out that the way I defined, the way Cook Reckell defined proof systems, they're always sound and complete. And it's sound because uh, <laughs> it maps every string to a tautology. So it never, uh, it, you can't prove anything that's not a tautology and it's complete because the mapping is onto. So that means every tautology, there's some proof of it. Any questions? Okay, so the, some of the main questions that we ask is, first of all, uh, <clears throat> for a given proof system, which uh, we wanna know which formulas have efficient proofs in that proof system. And um, we'd like to prove, since we believe, most people believe NP doesn't equal co-NP, 
um, would like to prove uh, sort of unconditional or even conditional super polynomial lower bounds for, for arbitrary, arbitrary proof systems. <clears throat> um, the second thing is the automatizability question. Um, that's the question of um, how hard is it to actually search for uh, a P proof of a tautology or a P refutation of an unsat formula. They might, you know, there might be unsat formulas that have very short proofs, but it might be very hard to actually search for them. Um, and the third uh, thing is, is more, this is not, this is more of a intuition is that often proof systems P correspond to natural classes of algorithms. And so you can, by understanding uh, the proof system, proving lower bounds on the proof system, it sort of like tell, it rules out a large family of algorithms for solving SAT that are where intuitively where the correctness proof of that SAT algorithm can be formalized in the proof system. So there's a pretty strong connection for a, thick, for a fixed proof system like Frege or sum of squares. If you don't know what these are, I'll tell you in a minute. But for particular proof systems, <laughs> proving lower bounds for certain statements actually tell us a lot about in approximability results for, for corresponding classes of algorithms. <laughs> um, and lastly, we wanna understand the relative strengths of different proof systems. So I'm gonna tell you about some of the standard ones uh, and I, I kind of loosely characterize them, put them into three different groups, although there's overlaps. The first one is Boolean proof systems um, where lines represent Boolean functions in some circuit class. Examples of these are resolution, bounded depth Frege, regular Frege, extended Frege. Um, now we have algebraic proof systems <clears throat> where the lines in the proof actually represent polynomial equalities, so polynomial equations and, and, <clears throat> and multivariate polynomial equations. And examples of these are the null Stanthas proof system, <clears throat> polynomial calculus, and IPS. I'll define these in a minute. And the last type called semi-algebraic, these are proof systems where lines correspond to polynomial inequalities. Uh, and then to compare proof systems, um, Cook and Reckel define the notion of a polynomial simulation. And we say this proof system A polynomially simulates another proof system B if intuitively um, any tautology, if you have a proof in B of a tautology, you have to have a proof in A of the same tautology where the size of the A proof should be not much larger than the size of the B proof. So formally, for every tautology F and for every proof Y in B, um, there should be another proof Y prime in A, where Y prime, the length of it is polynomially related to the proof Y in B, um, where Y prime is a proof in A. And we say the two proof systems are polynomially equivalent if they each simulate one another. Um, and when we wanna compare proof systems over different uh, connectives, then we're gonna, what I'll do for the talk is we'll just assume that everything that we start with, all the tautologies or unset formulas, they're, they're always a CNF or, a, no, it's, it's always an unset CNF formula or it's an always a D, or it's always a DNF tautology. And then we just convert. Um, so if it's, if it's a CNF formula, we just, or a DNF, we just convert in the, in the sort of most, most natural way to, you know, polynomial inequalities if we're working in semi-algebraic or polynomial equalities if we're working, um, that's the one below. So if we're working with algebraic proof systems, we would do this conversion. We would convert this clause to this polynomial equation. And if we're working in semi-algebraic systems, we would do this other conversion to convert this clause to this corresponding um, yeah, polynomial inequality. It's actually just a linear, linear inequality. Does that make sense so far? Okay, so this is some of the proof systems that I'll be briefly talking about, but don't worry, it's a lot of them can be described sort of in one slide. So the purple ones are what I'm referring to as the Boolean ones, although you can see the spillover because if you know what cutting planes is, it's actually also can be viewed as a semi-algebraic system. Um, and then the red ones are the algebraic ones, and there's, I'm only gonna briefly mention SOS, which is, uh, sorry, the red ones are the algebraic ones and SOS is a semi-algebraic one. And the arrows are correspond to P simulations. So IPS appears the strongest of the ones that are in this picture. And IPS can simulate extended Frege and so on. Okay, so first I'll start by telling you about the Boolean ones and they're sort of the most common, most well-studied proof systems. Uh, and they're I'll just refer to them all as Frege systems. 
Um, and these are, in fact, all of these systems except for IPS are uh, called their axiomatic proof systems and that all of them, uh, the, the proof system is equipped with a certain number, finite number of axiom schemas and rule schemas and a proof of a tautology is a directed acyclic graph like in this picture where each of the vertices is labeled with uh, some formula. Um, and the, the leaf, the ones at the top are axioms, instances of axioms of the proof system. And all the intermediate ones have to follow from the previous ones by applying one of the rules. And the formula F that you're trying to prove should be the one at the bottom. And the size is just the sum of the sizes of all the formulas in the whole DAG. And we'll call a proof, a, if, if C is a complexity class, we'll call a proof a C Frege proof if all of these lines are restricted to, uh, they can only involve um, formulas that are represented in the class C. Good so far? Okay, so we have this hierarchy of C Frege systems as the circuit class C gets bigger and bigger. Resolution at the bottom corresponds to like a depth one, Frege, a depth one circuits, AC zero. Frege is, you know, un bounded depth um, circuits over and polysized circuits over and or unbounded finite and or not. AC zero P probably everybody knows these are where the lines correspond to circuits where you have unbounded fan and unbounded fan and, and or gates. You also have mod P gates and you also have negation and so on. And um, yeah, I'll talk more about lower bounds in a minute. Okay, so since resolution is like the, the kind of the staple, the most, um, the most well-studied one, I'll just actually define that one. It's really easy to define. So it's a, it is actually set up to be a refutation system. So you start, you, it, it takes, uh, it's trying to refute unsat formulas in conjunctive normal form. And there's only one rule and the rule, uh, the lines in the proof are clauses or disjunctions of literals. And the one rule is called the resolution rule. And if you have a clause A or X, where X is a variable and A is a disjunction of a bunch of literals and another clause B or not X, then you can resolve away X to derive the clause A or B, okay? And a refutation of F is a DAG where at the top, you just, you start with all of the clauses. Um, you assert that they're all true. In other words, there's an assignment that satisfies them all. So that they sit at the top and then you just repeatedly apply this rule over and over again. And you're trying to derive the empty clause and the size of a resolution proof because clauses are small. We can just take the size to be the total, you know, the total size of the DAG. Okay, and then stronger proof systems, C Frege proof systems, there's many different ways uh, to describe them and they're pretty robust to different definitions. Um, I'm, not, I'm not gonna get too much into the details, but um, a particular formulation that's quite nice is, is called the sequent calculus. And um, <clears throat> lines are sequence. And what, uh, what a sequent is, is it's just a bunch of formulas A1 through AN. Uh, and then an arrow, which is called, uh, what's it called? I'll, I'll call it arrow, I forget the name of it. And on the right is another bunch of formulas, B1 through BM, and we'll abbreviate the formulas on the left by gamma and the formulas on the right by delta. And the meaning of a sequent is that the conjunction of the AIs implies the disjunction of the BIs. Um, you're probably wondering, well, why don't I just make the line be, you know, be, the line could just be A1, and A N implies B1 or B M. I could have just made that the line, but for, for reasons that uh, may or may not become clear today, it's, a, it's particularly nice to not write it this way and just instead write it this way. In this arrow here, not this one I just drew, <laughs> sorry, this one, this arrow here is not a symbol of the underlying logic, it's a meta symbol, okay? <clears throat> Um, so again, you can think of a C Frege formulated as a sequence calculus, that's what the lines look like. And if you want to use a C Frege proof to prove a tautology, you start the, the, at the top, you label these with axioms of the, system, of the Frege system. I'll tell you what the axioms are, what the one axiom is in a minute, but you label the top with the axioms and you derive se sequence one at a time until finally you're trying to derive, if you wanna prove that F is a tautology, 
you're trying to derive arrow f, which is saying that f is true. And if you want to view it as a refutation system, you start with all the, the, the top here, you can have instances of axioms of the C-Frege system, plus you can assert not f is true. And now you're trying to derive the empty sequence, which corresponds to false. Okay, so you can view it either way. Um, <clears throat> and so it's a lot of rules, which maybe is not nice when you first see it, but they're actually, they make, it, they make a lot of sense. So there's only one axiom, A implies A, and then the weakening rule just says you can add more stuff to the left and the right, and it just makes the statement weaker. So if a bunch of things in gamma imply the disjunction of things in delta, then I can add more things to gamma and add more things to delta, and it's still going to be it's still going to be true that the conjunction of the stuff on the left implies the disjunction on the right. And then you have the logical rules, and you have one rule. In this case, I'm formulating a C Frege curve system where the underlying connectives are and or and not. So, but in general, whatever the underlying set of connectives are, you have one, usually one rule to introduce a new and for each connective, that connective on the left of a sequence, and then one rule to introduce that connective on the right. So for example, the and right rule um, says that basically if you can derive A from some things and you can derive B some, from some things, then you can derive A and B. And, the, and so that's introducing this and on the left. So you're building up a, a bigger formula from smaller formulas. And the and left rule does a similar thing. <clears throat> And similarly, we have a rule for or introducing or on the right and introducing or on the left. Oops, this is a mistake here. That should be, sorry. Maybe this should be A or B on the left. It should look like that. Um, and likewise for the negation. Um, so already with just these rules that I've showed you, the system is complete. Um, might not be obvious, but it is. And, um, but it's pretty weak proof system. So it's called cut-free Frege or cut-free sequence calculus. And the reason it's weak is that uh, it satisfies the subformula property. A subformula property means that whatever, if I'm trying to prove that F is a tautology, so the last line in the proof is arrow F, let's say F is a DNF formula, which is without loss of generality, then every single formula in the entire proof that occurs in every sequence has to be a subformula of, of the last line of F. So it has to be a subformula of F. And you can just sort of, it's just because weakening adds things, whoops, weakening adds things, but the rules don't let you get rid of them. So the logical rules only, uh, only um, grow formulas. And since the last line has to just have F in it, if you, if you tried to weaken to, you know, to get something that wasn't a subformula of F, it would stick around and you wouldn't be, you wouldn't end up with a line arrow F. Okay, so it's like, it's monotone with respect to um, F. <clears throat> so the, the power of a Frege system comes from the cut rule, which is the last rule. And the cut rule is kind of like modus ponens. You should think of it as saying, if I put, so A, anytime you have a formula on one side of the sequence, it's, sort of, it's equivalent to have a negation of it on the other side. So you can think of the cut rule intuitively is this is saying that from a bunch of things, I can derive not A, and from a bunch of things, I can derive A. Sorry, I said that the wrong way. So if, if I can derive something from A, so just pretend gamma was not here. If I can derive something from A, and I can derive that same thing from not A, because this is A on the right here is like putting it, negating it and putting it on the left. So if I can derive something from A and I can derive it from not A, then I can derive it without A at all. So it's like kind of like modus ponens. And this is where the power is coming from in the proof system, because now if you want to prove something, uh, you can come up with some idea or you know, reason why it's true that doesn't have anything to do with the, the formula that you're trying to prove. Let me show you an example. So the uh, cannot, maybe a one canonical example is the pigeon, propositional pigeonhole principle. Um, so the pigeonhole principle uh, with M pigeons and N holes, uh, you have variables P, I, J, where I goes from one to M and J goes from one to N. And the variable P, I, J is intended, is, if it's true, that represents that pigeon I gets mapped to hole J, okay? 
And the clauses state you have two types of, so I'm stating this is a unsat CNF formula. So it'll be a CNF formula. And now I'm describing the clauses. So the pigeon, there's two types of clauses. The pigeon clauses say that for every pigeon I, it has to get mapped to some hole. And the whole axioms say that for every two, uh, for every uh, whole J, um, and for every two pigeons I1 and I2, they both can't map to J. So altogether, they're saying that for every whole J, at most one pigeon maps to J. Okay. And the way I described this, it's the it's not necessarily a mapping because I didn't uh, add axioms that force the every pigeon to go to exactly one hole. I just said that each pigeon has to go to at least one hole. Okay, so you can add, if you wanna, if the functional pigeonhole principle is when you add more constraints, it makes it even more unsatisfiable intuitively that say that, um, you know, that every pigeon maps to exactly one hole, but already it's unsatisfiable in this form. Um, and if you don't have cuts, it's, uh, it's not too hard to show that any cut free proof requires exponential size. Uh, and it was conjectured that for a while that this original principle required uh, large Frege proofs. Um, but then Sam Buss proved, I think it was in the 80s, um, that actually there is a Frege proof and you have to use cuts obviously because there's a lower bound here. And the proof intuitively, what it does is it uses the pigeon axioms to derive the fact that the sum of all the edges coming out of the left which is really just the sum of all the edges, uh, has, to be at mo has to be at least M because each intuitively each pigeon, uh, there has to be at least one edge coming out of every node on the left by the pigeon axiom. So then the total sum has to be at least M of all of the edges. And on the other hand, using the whole axioms, you can, <clears throat> you can derive that the total sum of all these edges has to be, is, has to be at most N because the whole axioms say that, you know, at most one pigeon maps there. And so if M is bigger than N, then that's a contradiction. But in order to carry out this proof, you really need uh, to be able to talk about, um, uh, you need to be able to talk about the sum of these edges. So you need a formula that, um, you know, on a given input to these variables outputs the number of edges that, you know, number of these edges that are, that are all true, okay. And that's, that, uh, we have to be, you know, you can do that with polysized formulas. And so that's why there's a... <clears throat> one small question. Just, pardon me? Oh, one small question. Uh, is there any research on like how many cuts are necessary to prove pigeonhole principle? Um, yeah, so um, I'm pretty sure that... Uh, that Um, I think it depends what formulation you're actually in. Um, so is there a cut-free uh, proof? No, 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 no. There's certainly not a cut-free proof. And we know that there's no uh, AC0 Frege proof. So if, you're, if the lines are only allowed to talk about AC0, um, functions computed in AC0, then we can't prove the pigeonhole principle. Um, it was a war call. And intuitively, that's that's because you can't count in AC zero. But the proof is actually much more complicated than that. It's not a direct reduction to the AC zero circuit lower bound. Um, and the, but the question about cuts, I have to get back to you on that. Um, I I feel like Sam Bus had in one of his papers that talked about various normal forms. He showed that you don't really need more than a constant number of cuts. Uh, well, cuts cuts on that and subformulas of that, but I but I'm not positive that I'm right on that. So I don't know if Sam's here, but wasn't there a a, um, a result by you, Marcel, and uh, Fong? Um, about uh, the amount of cuts that you need. Um, so that's a little bit different, but maybe we'll talk about that after. Okay. Yeah, I think that was not the normal pigeonhole principle, but a uh, Okay. okay, any other questions about this? So I'm hoping this gives you intuition uh, as to how, yeah, you know, what, what a C Frege proof is. So intuitively, 
if you have like an AC0 Frege proof, you're really only allowed to discuss functions. Um, you can only bring up functions or discuss them in the proof if they can be computed by poly size AC0 circuits. So you cannot carry out this, this particular proof that I just outlined at a high level. Um, <clears throat> but to, you know, like I said, to prove that AC0 Frege can't prove the pigeonhole principle, you, it's, it's not, we don't know of a, just a reduction to the, to the AC0 circuit bound. And the reason is that there might be other ways to prove this that don't use counting. So you kind of have to rule out every possible way to prove this with, you know, that show that no way of proving this just using AC0 lines will work. Okay. <clears throat> okay, so, yeah, so you have this kind of obvious hierarchy on, uh, going this way because resolution is like depth one Frege, this is constant depth Frege. So you, you can sort of see that it corresponds to the circuit classes. Uh, Frege corresponds to poly size formulas or NC1 and extended Frege corresponds to poly size circuits. Okay, so now by correspond, I mean the lines in the, in the, in the proof are restricted to be um, P slash fu functions computed in P slash poly. Okay. Okay, <clears throat> then let me talk about algebraic. Anybody have any questions so far? Okay, so now let me talk briefly about algebraic proof systems. So now we're gonna kind of switch gears a little bit and these proof systems are naturally not, not for um, deciding if something is a tautology, but they're for a different NP complete problem, which is decide, to decide whether a system of polynomial equations is solvable. Um, and so, so that's, that's what they're intended to do. So you have some underlying field F and if you don't include the X, well, if you have some underlying typically in general, it will have to, will have to be algebraically closed field. And you have a bunch of polynomial equations over variables X1 through Xn over that field. And you want to know, or you want to certify the proof, an algebraic proof will certify that there's no solution in F satisfying all these equations, so that these equations are unsolvable, okay? And again, even since this is just a different NP complete, NP hard problem, we can, we're, I'm gonna focus on um, using this, this proof system to refute unset CNF formulas. So we do that, like I said earlier, by just converting an unset CNF formula into, uh, so for every clause in the unset formula, you represent that clause by this corresponding polynomial. And then this set of polynomial equations corresponding to this unset CNF are all these polynomials corresponding to each of the clauses. And if this is a three CNF, this, this polynomial will be will have degree three, each of these polynomials have degree three. And then we're gonna add these extra equations, XI squared minus XI equals zero. And that's gonna force Intuitively, well, it's going to force solutions to lie, you know, to be zero, one valued only. Okay, and once you have these things, then you can, then you can assume that the F can be any field. It doesn't have to be algebraically closed. It can be a finite field. And Hilbert Snellstone, that's from algebraic geometry, states that in general, if you have a system of unsolvable equations over an algebraic or that a system of polynomials is unsolvable over an algebraic, algebraically closed field, if and only if, um, basically, if one is in the ideal generated by these polynomials, or said differently, if there's another set of polynomials, Q1 through Qm, such that the sum of the Pi's times the Qi's is one. And like I said before, if these polynomials include the Xi squared minus Xi's, I'm always gonna assume that these polynomials are uh, coming from translating an unset formula in, in this way. Okay, so in that case, we can F can be a finite field even, and we're going to in a null a null stance as refutation of the set of polynomials Q one. Oh, sorry, of the set of polynomials P is is this Q one through Q M. Okay, so these Q one through Q M witness that one is in the ideal generated by the PIs. And the measure of complexity for null stone size is just going to be the maximum degree um, of these QIs. And we also can measure it in terms of size, which is the you know, total number of monomials in all of the QIs. 
the sum of all the monomials and all the GIs. Um, <clears throat> and since we have this Xi squared minus Xi, we can also assume without loss of generality that these QIs are multilinear. Okay. Um, so this is not like an axiom. It doesn't look so much like an axiomatic system, but you can think of it as one, it's just a super simple one. We're allowed to take one of these PIs equals zero and you can multiply it by any other polynomial. And then you can take two, two derived polynomials and you can <clears throat> add them up. Okay, so that would be the two rules. Um, but I kind of wrote it in a flat way here as one, one big long, you know, I multiplied them and I added them up and it was like just one shot. <clears throat> polynomial calculus, the only difference between polynomial calculus and null census is how we measure degree. Um, <clears throat> so polynomial calculus, you can view it as a dynamic version of null census where you start with the P's at the top. And it's more like how you think of generating something in the ideal. So you start with the P's and you're allowed to multiply, um, you know, you're allowed to add two together and you're allowed to, if you already generated some polynomial F, you can multiply it by any other polynomial G. So those are the rules I just said before. And you're trying to derive one, you, you know, there's all, these polynomials always have equal zero on the right. So you're trying to derive one equals zero. Now, the difference is that now the degree is the maximum degree over all the polynomials in the refutation. So you can imagine that, that um, the degree here could be smaller, and I'll show you an example, than it was in the null Stalinsatz case. So I can take the same proof, and when I view it this way, it can have low degree because of cancellations, but if I am forced to write it as in just one shot, it, it could have high degree. Um, and the size is just the sum of the sizes of all the polynomials in the whole thing. So same as it was before. So here's an example where um, you can do something with much, much lower degree and size in the polynomial calculus. Um, and it's, it's sort of like the translate, the, it's, a, it's an induction principle. So uh, you have variables x1 through xn, and this constraint says that x1 is one, and th this constraint says if x1 is one, then x2 is one, and so on. In general, they say if xi is one, xi plus one is one. And the last one says that on the other hand, the last variable xn is zero, okay? Um, and way that you would prove it, sort of one way to prove it is just to, to start off with x1 is one and use the fact that if x1 is one, you, you take these two axioms, this saying x1 is one, this one saying if x1 is one, then x2 is one and use them to conclude that x2 has to be one and then iterate that. So up here, I start with the first axiom, which says x1 is one. And this one saying that if x1 is one, x2 is one. And if I multiply this by this, which I'm allowed to do and add these two together, <clears throat> then I'll end up with one minus x2. So that's saying x2 is one, okay? Now I wanna do the same thing. Now I have that x2 is one, and if x2 is one, x3 is one, and I wanna conclude that x3 is one. So I take this one and I multiply it by one minus x3, add that, add this to this to get, to get one minus x3 and so on. Does that make sense? So I'm just carrying out the normal, the normal like linear way that you would prove induction. You know, x1 is one, then the next axiom says, okay, that means x2 is one and so on. And the degree, because I'm allowed to cancel, because I'm not carrying the degree of the whole thing with me, the degree never is never more than two. Um, but on the other hand, you can show that, well, this particular proof, if you wrote it as a null Stalinsatz proof, it would actually have degree n. Um, but you can do it more cleverly in a divide and conquer fashion and get a null Stalinsatz refutation of degree log n, and that's tight. So this is a separation between the two. And there's actually a linear separation between the two, but it's a little bit more complicated of an example. So again, the high level is that it's the same proof system. It's just, we're measuring degree differently. And because we're doing it, you know, step-by-step step, um, kind of as an axiomatic system in the polynomial calculus, we can, you know, we, we don't have to carry around the degree that we might have accumulated at the end and the degree can be smaller. Questions? Okay. Um, so the ideal proof system is, um, it's more or less the same proof system, but now we're, we're going to measure size very differently. Um, and instead of the basic thing is instead of before, we always measured size. We wrote out this polynomial Q, all the Qs, whether it was an all stone proof or a polynomial calculus, 
we wrote these out as you know sum of monomials and the size was you know the sum of the total number of one basically the size of this written this way but you could have written these polynomials as algebraic circuits and here's a picture of of uh, if I took this small stone so it's refutation and I rewrote it where this is Q2 written as a circuit and Q1 as a circuit that's built from Q2, then the size of this is much smaller. It's the same proof, but since I'm writing this as a circuit, the size is much smaller. Uh, and so in papers from the 90s, I defined this sort of this measure of complexity for um, null stone sets proofs. Uh, <clears throat> And so you can see that like polynomial calculus or null stone says when you measure su size by algebraic circuit size, it's gonna, it's, well, it's, it's, this is what you get. And then when a paper took, I didn't realize this, Josh actually had a really nice observation that allows us to put this proof system where we're measuring size by circuit size to actually put it in an even nicer form. So I'll describe that next. <clears throat> So it's more or less gonna, but this is the idea behind it. We're gonna be measuring size by the circuit size of the witnessing QIs. Um, and in this way, we can take polynomial calculus and generalize using this size measure, it becomes IPS. And similarly, the SOS semi-algebraic system was where you measure size algebraically, generalizes to this proof system that's called the cone proof system. I won't talk about this today. Um, but the nice form uh, is this form. So in this form, it's so I'm gonna I'm, instead of this is still a rule based view because I start with the pi's and you know I have I take a I'm only allowed to take a pi and multiply it by a qi and then add them all together. So it has to have this particular form. But I'm just measuring the q the complexity of the qi's by the smallest algebraic circuit size. But it turns out that you can actually do away with this rule based thing and you can view this whole thing is one big circuit. Um, and that's what I, that's the IPS view. Um, <clears throat> so an IPS proof of these polynomials is a single circuit C, okay, here's a picture, but C has two kinds of variables, the X variables that are the original ones, X1 through Xn. And then we have, uh, I'm, I'm assuming this set of polynomials came from, you know, uh, there's M of these equations. So then I have m new variables, y1 through ym, and you can think of these as placeholder variables for these polynomials. Okay? So this is just a single circuit in the x variables and the y variables, and it has to satisfy two properties. The first property is that when you plug in zero for all the y variables, the circuit should be identically zero. And the second property is that when you plug in the pi's for all the y variables, so y1 gets replaced by p1 and so on, then this, the polynomial, this polynomial computed by this algebraic circuit should be identically one. And these two properties together uh, imply that one is in the ideal generated by these polynomials. Okay, because this is saying that, you know, these polynomials, you know, when you plug in the P's for the Y's, you get one. And this is saying that, you know, you couldn't have cheated. So you, that, that, um, yeah, so by putting in zero here, it means you can't, you, you, you can't, you, it, you can only use the PIs or the YIs to generate something. So the nice thing about this is that it's not, you know, it's not a rule-based proof system anymore. It's just a single circuit. And these two properties are verifiable and they're both versions of polynomial identity testing. So they're both verifiable in randomized polynomial time. <clears throat> so, because it's randomized polynomial time, it's not actually a cook recal proof system because we don't know, we can't prove unconditionally that PIT is in poly time. Um, so it's, it's so pro the, this proof, these proofs are verifiable in, in RP and randomized polynomial time. Um, but we ex since we expect that um, PIT is actually, since we expect that PIT is in P, it's probably a cook recal system, not sure. Um, but in any case, uh, we can still show, you know, the same way you show that um, that randomized version of NP, if that was equal to cohen P, the polynomial hierarchy would collapse. The same thing is true here. So we still expect that IPS is not polynomially bounded. If it were, 
then instead of NP equal co NP, we would have that co NP would be equal to MA. So it's still, it'll still be a big surprise. Does that make sense? And uh, also showed in the first papers that IPS can simulate extended Frege. And you can restrict the same way we restricted Frege to be C Frege, where you, you know, you can restrict this circuit class to be of a certain type, like maybe depth four, quasi polynomial size, whatever it is. And then uh, what we, what I showed, what Josh and I showed, is that for a large class of natural algebraic circuit classes C, C IPS can simulate the corresponding C Frege system. So these seem to be these are definitely just as at least as strong as Frege and maybe much stronger, we're not sure. Any questions? No, okay. Okay, so this gives us this picture. Um, I, I didn't talk about SOS yet. Let me just, let me just quickly mention SOS. So SOS, so semi-algebraic systems, instead of equalities, like we had before we had these PIs were equal to zero. Now we have that these polynomials are greater than or equal to zero. And we're trying to certify that there's no solution over the reals to these polynomial inequalities. Okay? And there's a positive Stellenzatz that's the analog of null Stellenzatz for polynomial for sem in a semi-algebraic situation. That's sort of like the, the theorem behind the completeness of these semi-algebraic systems. Um, and again, we'll always be converting everything uh, wrote, I'm always going to be assuming that we were mostly interested in proving unsatisfiability of CNF formulas, so we'll always do this conversion. Um, so SOS is sort of like the analog of null Stellenzatz, but for semi-algebraic proof systems, but it's it's stronger. And um, again, it's so you say that this set of uh, inequalities, polynomial inequalities. Uh, <clears throat> has a sum of squares proof that these are unsolvable over the reals it is a bunch of polynomials Q1 for, through QM. And now these polynomials are sum of squares. In other words, each of these QIs is some polynomial squared. And the reason we wanna square it is since we're starting with these things being bigger than or equal to zero, we wanna be able to multiply them by something and that better be strictly positive because otherwise, just because this is zero, if, if we multiply, if by something negative, then it wouldn't still be zero. So we want to force anything we multiply the PIs by to be strictly positive. And the natural way to do that is to be, be allowed to multiply PI by any polynomial that's ra raised to the two so that it's strictly positive. Uh, so Q zero is just some arbitrary sum of squares polynomials. And then you can take the sum of these sum of squares QI, PI, and you're trying to derive minus one. Okay. And again, this is a sound and complete proof system. It's, it's stronger than null Stellenzatz. Um, and it sits, well, I showed you where it sits here. It sits like right here. And the cone proof system is stronger than IPS and it would sit up here. It would sit up here. Does anybody have any questions? Okay, so that was my really quick survey of some of the most common systems that, that people study. Um, and so now I want to talk about the automatizability question for proof system. And, and connections to other things, including feasible interpolation. Okay, so like I said in the beginning, automatizability is a, is a, um, that's an algorithmic question. And it's sort of the, I view it as like the meta algorithmic question associated with proof complexity, the same way MCSP is like, the, well, there's lots of different versions of MCSP, but it's sort of the algorithmic question in, in circuit complexity. And so the question here is how hard is it to search for, given a proof system P, how hard is it to search for P proofs of some formula F? And if you were trying to find a proof and you, and you, you but let's say you were trying to find a proof of length S. So the total number of such proofs is exponential in S. So that's not so good. Um, on the other hand, for any, pretty much any proof system, you can always like have a truth table proof that just tries all possible two to the n assignments. And so that proof has size two to the n and it's super easy to find because it's just a deterministic algorithm. So like the smaller the proof is in the proof system, the seems that the more tricky it might be to find, but the bigger the proof, 
is, the easier it'll be to find. And the real question here is, uh, for what proof system is it the case that you can always find a proof uh, of every uh, of every um, pathology, and you want the proof you want the algorithm to run in time polynomial in the size of the smallest proof of the formula in that proof system. So we don't we don't expect it to run in poly time because a lot of a lot of formulas don't even have poly sized proofs in that proof system, but we could expect that that it would at least be able to search for proofs of size S in time polynomial or quasi polynomial in S. Okay, so, so the definition of a proof system being automatizable is that you say that it's <clears throat> automatizable and I'll usually, uh, be, I'll usually use automatizable to mean polynomially automatizable. So a proof system is polynomial automatizable. Um, if there's an algorithm that given an arbitrary unset formula F or tautology, outputs a P proof of it in time, pol F here's polynomial, polynomial in S, where S is the size of the shortest P refutation of that. Does that make sense? Okay. Is this too slow, too fast, good pace? People are quiet. Pardon me? It's not too slow. <laughs> oh, should I go slower? <laughs> no, come <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, yeah, really, I don't know. I think it's good. I mean, <laughs> but not faster. Yeah, if, okay. If you have any questions at all, just ask them, slow me down. Me yes, uh, this, is the, this is the search version. If, if you're saying this is like MCSP, this is like the search version of MCSP. Does the yeah. version? Yeah. Yes, you're right. You can also ask, what is the size of the shortest, of the shortest refutation? Are there search to decision deductions? Um, the, uh, yeah, I think that there are for, for many of them. Yeah. I think for MCSP, well, I would argue that it's, it's more interesting or it's more, it's more informative to not just know what the size is, but to, yeah, but to, but to actually have the circuit, output a circuit that's of size, polynomial the size of the shortest one. So again, there's a little, another difference here in that I don't care about the exact so I don't necessarily want you to output the smallest proof. I just want you to output a proof in the proof system that's within a polynomial of the size of the shortest proof. Um, if you want to do it exactly, we know that that's NP hard for almost all proof systems. So it's maybe it's more like an approximation version of MCSP. Okay. So some motivation behind automatizability question is first, you know, there's theorem provers are based on, all theorem provers are based on some underlying complete proof system, whether it's a propositional theorem prover, which is a SAT solver, or whether it's a first order or second order theorem prover, they're all based on some underlying complete proof system. And so, uh, you know, it's kind of fundamental whether or not it's uh, even in the worst case, the first question you would ask is in the worst case, can you even find proofs efficiently if they exist? Um, secondly, if a proof system is automatizable, and the, 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 big, you know, the, the big gun here is the SOS proof system, um, it's not exactly automatizable, but it's almost. Uh, but if a proof system is automatizable, then you can actually use it to, uh, to get new algorithms. And I'm not going to say much about this, but if you have a proof system that's automatizable, uh, so it, it was... A, Lots of really exciting papers in the last decade kind of use this strategy. So they, they uh, for solving a bunch of distributional problems and unsupervised learning problems, also for coming up with new approximation algorithms for optimization problems. And the idea is that if you can prove in the proof system, in this case, SOS, something, let's say you're trying to get a, get, give a learning algorithm, okay? And if you can prove the sample complexity upper bounds in the proof system, so if you can show that you don't need too many samples, this is very rough. Then uh, since, since the proof system's automatizable, you will ought kind of automatically get from, uh, fr from the proof and then the automatizability, you'll kind of automatically get the learning algorithm. I mean, it's not so automatic, but this is like the high level intuition. I mean, it has been used to, you know, to come up with new ideas for solving all sorts of interesting, like I said, distributional problems. Um, another 
uh, motivation, and we'll talk about this one in more detail, is it's very tightly connected to feasible interpolation, which is a, a main method for proving lower bounds for proof systems. And I'll also mention that it's a, a general, in general, this automatizability question. Uh, so it's kind of the analog of MTSP. It's also kind of the analog of whether you can pack learn a particular uh, circuit class. Um, so I want to just tell you the connection between automatizability and feasible interpolation, which has been very successful. Um, <clears throat> so Krychek introduced, interpolation has been around um, in logic for a long time, but Krychek introduced the idea of feasible interpolation for a proof system. And uh, first, so to define this, I have to first tell you what an interpolant formula is. So it's a propositional formula. I'm writing it in conjunctive normal form. Uh, and you have two parts, an A part and a B part. And the A, the a part and the B part share the Z variables, so they're common. And the X ones are private to A and the Y variables are private to B. And that this a formula of this type is called an interpolant formula. Okay. And if this is an unsat formula, the whole thing, okay, then what do we know? We know that for any assignment alpha to the z variables, when you plug in that assignment into a and b, a, a now is only a function of the x variables, and b is only a function of the y variables, so they're disjoint. So that means if the whole thing's unsatisfiable and you plug in an assignment to the z variables. It has to be the case that they both can't be satisfiable. So at least one of them. Uh, did I say that wrong? Yeah. So yeah. So they both can't be satisfiable because otherwise the whole thing is satisfiable. Okay. So the interpolant function is basically an underlying computational problem associated with an unsatisfiable interpolant formula, and it takes as input an assignment to the z variables. And it's supposed to tell us which of these two formulas under that assignment is, is unsat. So is A unsat or is B unsat? They both could be unsat, in which case we give any answer that we want. But given an assignment alpha, if, if, uh, if B is unsat and A is sat, then we want to say one. And if it's the other way around, then we want to say zero. And if they're both unsat, then we can say star. Okay, so it's sort of telling us which of these two formulas is unsatisfiable. And if, like I said, if they both are, then there's no real content. So here's an example of an interpolant formula um, that clique that you have to the A part. So the Z variables are, is describing some graph on say N vertices. In this case, N is I think nine, so nine vertices. Um, and the X variables here are describing a clique of size K. In this example, K is five. So this is a formula that's expressing the fact that uh, the subset of K vertices encoded by X is a clique in the graph Z. So here's a picture of like, maybe this would be a, maybe maybe X is, is, is saying that these five vertices form a clique in the graph Z. And this side, the Y variables here are describing a K minus one coloring. So the, a partition of the vertices into K minus one pieces and this part here is saying that, uh, that all of the non-edges in this, so all the edges within a group are, are, not, are also not in the graph. So in other words, uh, you can partition the vertices of the graph into, in this case, four pieces where the only edges are between the pieces. And of course, we know by pigeonhole principle that it can't be the case that the same graph has a clique of size K and a coloring of size K minus one. So this is unsat. And moreover, if I plug in any graph Z, um, the interpolant function should be telling me whether or not it's, whether it doesn't have a clique or whether it doesn't have a K minus one coloring. Okay. And if it doesn't have either, then it can give me any answer at all. Um, so we're extracting, so we can extract computational content via the interpolant function from a given unset interpolant formula. And Krychek proposed this as a, as a way to, um, to prove lower bounds. If your proof system, oh, I didn't tell you what feasible interpolation means. Um, so here's another example. Um, this is a very important example. Uh, it's another interpolant formula that's unset. Uh, now Z is, uh, corresponds to um, 
a formula that's an X corresponds to an encoding of a refutation of this formula Z. This part is saying that X encodes a refutation of Z. And this part saying that Y encodes a satisfying assignment to Z. And if the proof system P is sound, then you know, for any given formula encoded by Z, either it has a refutation or it's satisfiable. It can't be both. Um, so this is going to be unsat. And for and again, the interpolant function will tell us for any assignment, for any formula, whether or not it has a refutation of a certain size or, or whether it's sat. Okay. And these basically any anything like this, the the what you end up with is like two disjoint NP pairs. <clears throat> okay, so again, Krychek suggested this a way, this is a way to prove lower bounds for proof systems. So we'll say a proof system has feasible interpolation uh, if there's an algorithm um, that basically can compute, um, that can compute an interpolant function for every interpolant formula. And the, where the runtime of the algorithm should be polynomial in the size of the shortest p refutation of the interpolant formula. So you should think of it as you have an unset interpolant formula. It has a proof in p. So and the algorithm a should be able to look at the proof. So given an assignment to the common variables, it should be able to look at the proof and basically tell from looking at the proof in polynomial time whether or not a the a part is unset or the b part is unset. Okay. <clears throat> And so just, just want to say one more thing. So if a proof system has feasible interpolation, then you can then you get conditional lower bounds. Uh, you know, you, you can use one of these interpolant functions. And if you think that these, you know, if you have an interpolant function that you think is hard, then then you then you would get lower bounds for the proof system under the assumption that that interpolant function is hard. Okay, and this was actually realized. So we were able to a series of papers by many people. Uh, we were able to prove lower bounds for a lot of proof systems using this technology. Okay, and I think Susanna will be talking a lot more about this. Tony, the um, time is almost up. Oh, okay, great. So let me just. Uh, can I take the three more minutes? Mm. I'm going to take three more minutes. Hope that's okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, so it turns out that automatizability and feasible interpolation are almost equivalent. Um, so if, if a proof system is automatizable, then it has feasible interpolation. That's always true. And in the other direction, as long as the proof system is not too weak, the other direction holds. <clears throat> and so what that tells us is that kind of you get a dichotomy in the sense that if a proof system is automatizable, then you kind of know that the proof systems are simple um, because you can look at a proof and say which side is unset. And simple, you know, since P is then simple, we can get super polynomial lower bounds for that proof system because it's simple. And because we, because automatizability implies feasible interpolation, we're able to get sometimes conditional super polynomial lower bounds and sometimes unconditional depending on the situation. So you have this dichotomy where automatizable proof systems are kind of the simple ones where we have lower bounds for them. Um, and then we have the ones that aren't automatizable where they're not simple and we have a hard time proving lower bounds for them. Um, and so these ones in green here um, are basically automatizable and a reasonable amount of time. And the ones up here from AC0 P Frega, AC0 Frega and up, we know that they're not automatizable under crypto assumptions. Um, this is, uh, Suzanne will talk a lot more about this, but I just wanna say one, one thing, which is that um, there's a strong connection kind of at a high level at least between which proof systems are automatizable and kind of which, so again, proof systems correspond to circuit classes. So uh, C Frege proof system, whether or not it's on, uh, automatizable is very much related to whether that circuit class C is pack learnable, okay? And the same way, you know, if, if you have crypto, if you have a circuit class C and you can, uh, you know, you, you think you have um, pseudo random generators or one-way functions for that circuit class, 
then usually you can prove that it's hard to pack learn that class in poly time under crypto assumptions. Same thing's true here. And on the other hand, if you don't have crypto, then just like we can usually uh, get learning algorithms here, we can usually get upper bounds. So automatizability algorithms. Um, so there's a, there's a kind of a intu intuitive, or, or I mean, this is not like a formal connection, but it's sort of the same things happening. Um, so, and so for the weak proof systems, we can't prove that they're not automatizable under crypto. You know, we'd like to prove they're hard somehow, but we end up having to prove, trying to prove they're NP hard, which is actually much harder. In the same way for back learning, it's hard to prove, it was very hard to prove that, you know, a pack learning DNF formulas is, is NP hard. I hope that makes some sense. Sorry, I ran a little bit over. Does anybody have any questions before we stop? Or should we, do you want to ask them when we come back? Maybe one quick question and then uh, defer the questions to the next uh, talk by Tony. Yeah. Yes, Hanley. Uh, is there uh, any notion of visible in the I couldn't hear you, sorry. Uh, is there a notion of... Um, uh, is, is there a notion of feasible interpolation that corresponds to weak automatability? Um, that's an interesting question. Not that I know of. Does anybody? Um, feasible interpolation and weak auto. Oh, sorry, I didn't hear the question. Okay, that, that's what you meant. Yeah, so sorry, I, I didn't distinguish between the two here, but maybe I should say something about that. So just with like with pack learning, how you have proper pack learning and then you have ordinary, where proper means you have to output something from the same circuit class. We have the same thing happening here. There's two notions of automatizability. One is you have to output a proof in the same proof system. Um, that's kind of like the standard notion of automatizability. And then the weak version is, um, is where you just have to output a proof in some proof system. And for the strong proof systems, we can show under crypto assumptions that even weak automatizability is not possible. And it's weak automatizability that's connected to feasible interpolation. I don't think if you could hear Tony. Robert, Tony. I can hear you. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I'll say it a bit louder. So, so for for strong proof systems, weak automatability and feasible interpolation are the same. Your point, if and only if together. I'm sorry. Robert says that it is equivalent for strong proof systems, yeah. weak automatability and. Uh, and uh, interpolation is the same. Yeah, I mean, it's it's even equivalent for well, if we consider strong. I'm not sure what we're calling strong to be. But I, I meant able to prove its own reflection principle. Yeah, exactly, which is different than what I said strong was. So there are these, anyways, let's yeah. leave it up. Uh, okay, so I guess we, uh, we shall go to um, uh, the break now and uh, let's uh, thank uh, Tony. Okay, so I'll see you, I guess, in 25 minutes. Yes.